Christ is the understanding that we are in him and he is in us. And what counts for him has counted for us. His obedience. We, his obedience counts for us. His death counts for us. His burial counts for us. His resurrection counts for us. We've died with Christ. We've buried with Christ. We've risen with Christ. What was for him is for us. We are united to him. Hey Richard Fellowship, it's Oni here. I am super excited about this new series that we're about to jump into. Now, Christmas is around the corner, and so every year what we do is we take time to kind of walk through the scriptures, looking to understand why this season is important for us as the church. It's called Advent. We are in the Advent part of the year and so we're going to be diving into God's word and looking at the coming the first coming of Jesus Christ now Advent is a season marked by anticipation and waiting remembering the first coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and we anticipate his return one day when he will make all things new again and so the question on the table is this how do we faithfully watch and wait in the Advent season. One of the postures of doing that is by singing. And so in this Advent series that we've titled The Songs of Advent, uh, we're going to be looking at a few passages that would remind us of the goodness of Jesus. I'm excited about that and so should you. But what I'm also excited about is that we get Sikle Kuhn to come and lead us in this Advent series. He's gonna be our teaching pastor for the next couple of weeks. Uh, there'll be a few others speaking here and there, but he's gonna be leading us through this Advent series. And I am super, super excited because, man, Sikle is a phenomenal preacher. He's one of the best. Uh, he was with us for about two years uh, doing a church planting residency together with his wife, Latavo. And then we sent them out to go and plant a church. Renewal Fellowship is her name in the east of Johannesburg uh, earlier this year. And they're doing some amazing, amazing works. I'm just hearing encouraging stories of all that God is doing. Actually, they had a baptism service a couple of weeks ago, and I'm sure he'll share a little bit about that. Um, but I'm excited. I really am excited. I really feel that you are going to get uh, no better preaching in this season as we unpack our Advent series. And, and so, uh, Rooted Fellowship, would you give C. Clay a warm welcome as he comes up and preaches God's word as he leads us through this Advent series. Give us fresh bread, my brother. Greetings, Rooted Fellowship. Uh, Pastor Sihle here. Uh, it's good to be with you again. Uh, we uh, started an Advent C series last week, Sunday. Uh, it was really good to be with you. I was actually looking forward to be with you in, uh, like physically, um, but uh, Zoom did just well, so it's good to be with you again. We started a new series, uh, the Advent series, and we're looking at the songs, the songs that we see in Luke 1 and 2. Uh, we've called them the songs of Advent. Um, it's really good, actually, to, to look at, at, at the text there in, in, in Luke 1 and 2 and read those songs. Uh, these are the songs that introduce us into the birth of Jesus. Uh, last week, we saw the song of Mary, the song of Mary. A really um, a good digging in into that song. And what we saw there, just quickly, we saw that the coming of Jesus brings a reversal, a, a kingdom of reversal, an upside-down kingdom. We saw that with the coming of Jesus, he comes and gives favor to those that are marginalized, to those that are feeling low and vulnerable and weak, but those who are self-sufficient, those who are rich, in fact, in fact, it says on the text, those who are rich go away empty. Those who think that they have it all figured out, they go away empty. And I thought like the, just the song of Mary is such a, a comfort for us, specifically for where we are. Most of us are vulnerable. Most of us, a lot has happened this year. And to get this 
understanding, the advent, the coming of Jesus, he's coming to people like us who are feeling weak and vulnerable. Today we're looking at another song, another song from uh, Luke 1, uh, from verse 67 to, uh, to verse 80, uh, the song of Zechariah. Uh, this is one, again, great song of Zechariah. And one of the reasons why we're doing these songs, again, just to, to, to go back, these songs are the songs that people sing. You know, I, I know there's one song of the angels, uh, but this, this, this song, the people, uh, Mary, Zechariah, Simeon, these are the songs that people sing uh, in response to the coming of Jesus. But these are real people going through real stuff and, and, and thinking through the coming of the real Messiah in, in, into their real lives. It, it's, it's not just um, something that is abstract, something that is airy-fairy. This is real life people uh, in, in responding to what it means for them in, 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 in their reality for the Messiah to come. And the reason why we're doing that is because we want this Advent season to speak to us in our reality. Sometimes, I think I mentioned this last week, sometimes when we think of Christmas and this Christmas period, it can feel like it is something that is not reality. It, is, it doesn't feel meaningful because we've been going through so much this year. Most of us are still going through so much, uh, you know, with a pandemic just recent of the petrol hike, can't even go anywhere. There's so much happening. But now we are in this Christmas season, almost like we have to be joyful. We have to be all of these things, almost press pause to real life and get through this Christmas season and we'll get back to the ground again in Jan. And therefore, even in a church setting, even when we preach about these Christmas messages, it may feel like, oh, here we go again, preaching about Christmas, and it doesn't really get to the nitty-gritties of our ordinary life. But th that's different from Advent. Advent gives us a different approach. Advent speaks to us in our reality. Advent says, let's think about the coming of Jesus, the coming of the Messiah in the dark world. In a world filled with reality, in a world with uh, shepherds, in a world with uh, a teenage girl who's pregnant, in a, way, in a, in a world where the, 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 the couples, old couples can't have children, Zechariah and Mary, in a reality. And, and that's our goal. We want Advent to come into a reality. Because Advent, one of the main things about Advent, Advent puts us in touch with our waiting and our, and our longings. All of us have longings. All of us have things that in one way we are waiting for. And Advent, with Advent, we are supposed to feel the weight. We are supposed to, to anticipate that something or someone uh, that we are waiting for is coming or has come to change our trajectory, to change our lives. Jesus is not just coming in a vacuum. He's coming into our reality. What does it mean for Jesus to come where you are right now? We're supposed to feel the weight. And be in the moment of waiting. One of the things that Advent teaches us, talking about waiting, that God does something in us while we are waiting as much as, the, meaning that what God is doing in us while we are waiting is as much as important as what we are waiting for. That God forms us. There's a formation that's happening in our lives while we are waiting. And therefore, uh, be alert in your waiting. In, in whatever is happening in your waiting, God is doing something in you. Sometimes we can focus on what we are waiting for so much that we fail to see what God is doing in us while we are waiting. And in our text today, we are introduced to people who have been waiting. We are introduced to people who have been waiting. We are looking at the song of 
Zechariah, the song of Zechariah. Uh, now, I want us to go back to the context of, 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 of Zechariah's life, him and his wife, Elizabeth, because it is going to give us a context of, uh, we're going to understand his song if you understand his life. And I want to take us back to, to verse 5, Luke 1, verse 5, where we are introduced to this couple, and an elderly couple, uh, Elizabeth and, and, um, and Zechariah, Please, if you've got a Bible with you, uh, whether you've got a device or a Bible with you, turn with me to Luke 1 from verse 5. It says, In the time of Herod, the king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron, meaning they're coming from the, a priestly family. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly, but they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, to conceive, and they were both very old. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. I pray now as we open up your word that it will speak to us. Speak to us to, from, from where we are, Lord. Uh, come into our lives, um, in our ordinary lives, and speak to a word of encouragement, a word that will uh, point us to your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Be with us, we pray, because we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, there's so much just in these two verses, verse 5 and verse 6, looking uh, at, at this context of uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth. What we see in these verses is that uh, uh, we see that Zechariah is, is, in fact, we're going to see that as we continue in the verses uh, from verse 8 going downwards, Zechariah, they, they, get, they get visited by an angel, by an angel after a long time of waiting. As it says here, that, that they are very old, but they are childless. Now, for them to be childless, in that context, it must have been a difficult thing. In fact, there was a sense that if you are childless, it was some sort of a judgment from God. The, 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 it, it was a, a very uh, a tough time for people who could not give birth. So they've been a, 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 there's been longing in, in, in the life of Mary, in the life of um, Elizabeth and Zechariah, a, a long time of longing. The story of Luke 1, what we, what we see now with, with, with Elizabeth and, 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 and Zechariah, it's actually similar to the story we, we've seen in Genesis 12, the story of Abraham and Sarah, who have been having a hard time conceiving, and they've come to an old age. For some of us who might be used to the scriptures, we'll know that story. It's the same story we find here, just different names, but similar story. In fact, it, it's, it's the same with us. We may be different people with different names, but we share struggles, same struggles and problems because we share in this life of brokenness. We share in this life of, of a broken world. We share longings. We share things that we, are, we have been waiting for. For whoever is watching this, you are longing for something. Whoever's watching this, you've been waiting for something. For some of us, when we talk about longings, it is, it is something that is right up our alley. You know, there are things that we are longing for right now. But for some of us, maybe not. You know, when we talk about longings and things we are waiting for, it is things that we have actually just suppressed. We don't even want to think about them anymore. Uh, we don't even want to sort of raise that conversation again of, of longing for something. But Advent actually uh, uh, um, helps us or pushes us to be in touch with our longings. To say, actually, we are longing for something. When was the last time you really longed for something? When was the last time you really longed for love? Longed for God to show up in your life. We longed for God to, to be present in your life. Long for a life as God meant it to be for you. When was the last time you longed for healing? Emotionally, physically. When was the last time you longed for change? 
When was the last time you longed for something? And, it, and it's so interesting when we, when we look at the Gospels. Throughout the Gospel, uh, Jesus presses on this question of the longing of people. He, he, he would ask people, what do you want? I, even if he can see that this is what these people need, but he will want to get to the bottom of what's happening in their lives. He, he, he would ask them, what do you want me to do for you? What is your real longing? How would you answer that today? If Jesus would ask you, which he is by the Spirit right now, what is your longing? What are, you le- what are you really longing for? I feel like that is such a, a crucial question for us right now. It's a question for all of us. What are we longing for? And importantly, how are we doing in our waiting? How are you doing in your waiting? Here's something that interest, that, that's so interesting in our text. In, 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 in verse 6, it says, Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Elizabeth and Zechariah, they've been waiting for years. Probably have given up. In fact, we're going to see there that there's a sense that Zechariah has, has, has almost given up. But the interesting thing it says here, in all of their waiting, they were both righteous and blameless in the sight of God. Wow. Wow. In all of their waiting, they were both righteous and blameless before God. Which which brings the question, how are you doing in your waiting? Will you be righteous and blameless before God in your waiting? Will I? Am I righteous and blameless in the sight of God in my waiting? And what is interesting about waiting, what's so interesting about waiting is that it can reveal our true motives in terms of our relationship with God. There's something that reveals your motives more than the way you wait, your posture in waiting. Are you only worshiping God so that he can come through for you in your longing, in your waiting, and if it doesn't, you are out. If it doesn't, you are out. Will you worship him even if he doesn't pull through? Look, look at Mary and Elizabeth. They're an old couple that the scripture says with everything, with all their longing, with all their waiting, they were righteous and blameless in the sight of God. Have you given God three months, three years to come through, otherwise you are out? Are you starting to pull away because God didn't come through in your waiting? Pull away from community? Pull away from your relationship with God? And our text today wants us to, to remind us it is possible to be righteous and blameless in your waiting. I like what Elise Fitzpatrick says, talking about this. She says, if you are willing to sin to obtain your goal, or if you sin, if you don't get what you want, then your desire has taken God's place. You are functioning as an idolater. Uh, Let me say that again. If, If you are willing to sin, meaning that you've been waiting for something and it's not coming and you're willing to sin to get it, Or if you sin, if you don't get it, then your desire has taken God's place and you're functioning as as an idolater. These are the complexities of faith. Here's a couple doing all the right things, blameless and righteous, yet they haven't gotten what they long for. It's the tension of faith. And, and, And that could be you saying, but I've been doing the right things. But I've been that good person. I've been that. Why am I not getting what I'm longing for? Welcome to the text. Will you be holy in your waiting? And then something interesting happens here. Zechariah is, he gets this angelic visitation that tells him about his prayers, that his prayers have been answered. 
that they're going to have a child, finally. You know, meaning that Zechariah has been praying. In all, this old, in all his years, he's been praying. He hasn't been given up praying. And, and the angel comes and tells him that they will finally have a child. In verse 19, the angel answered, uh, I'll start from verse 18. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man. My wife is well along in years. Zechariah is saying, how can this happen? Almost like how Mary said, how can this happen? Zechariah is saying he, he, he couldn't believe it. Almost what I was mentioning, he almost has given up. He could not believe. He says, we are old. How can this happen? Now, it says in verse 19, the angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. I have been sent to speak to you, and I tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not be able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. Such an interesting turn of events. Zechariah can't believe the news from the, from the angel. He says, there's no way this could happen. The angel says, listen, man, I've been sent by God. Who are you to tell me it's not going to happen? For that, you know, I don't know if anyone has, 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 has plain, played uh, uh, Crazy 8. You know, there's a thing that you say, we take two for bising. You know, you, you, you take two for not doing things right. The, the angel says, you, you, for that, you, you're not, you're not going to be able to speak. You're going to go mute for nine months until this, this baby comes. For not believing, you, you're not going to speak, you're not being able to speak until this, this, the baby comes. And things happen exactly like that. Elizabeth and Zechariah, they get pregnant and they are blessed with a baby boy, John. It's just, I, I can imagine the joy that, that they're feeling. And we see with Zechariah, Again, he was mute. He, was, he couldn't speak for all those nine months because he, he didn't believe the good news. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I, I feel like I relate to Zechariah. You know, have you ever waited for something until you're actually convinced that it actually won't happen? You've waited for so long that actually you are convinced that it actually won't happen. No, you know what? I've prayed for this person to change they are never going to change. My, 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 my wife, my husband, they will never change in this aspect of their lives. I will never shake this sin off. Even if an angel can come and tell me it's going to happen, I will say, no way. Not that person. But we see here that even in, yes, yes, that, yes, that good news about this text. Even in the unbelieving of Zechariah, God still does the work. God still does the miracle. I, I, I like what Rich Veloda says. He says, Advent reminds us that we are often not faithful in our waiting, but God is faithful in his coming. Ooh. Even if most of us were not faithful in our waiting, but God is faithful in his coming. That is what we see in verse 20. In verse 20 it says, And now you will be silent and not being able to speak until the day this happened, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at the appointed time. What a good verse. What a good verse. It says you did not believe, but this thing is still going to come true in its appointed time. Wow. You know, th there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a verse in the Bible or verses in the Bible that, that talks about if we lack faith, God does not perform on our behalf. You know, there's a, especially if you read the, 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 the Gospels, there's a sense that God wants our faith. God is looking for our faith. In fact, we even see that even in, in a town, there's a town that Jesus couldn't do miracles because they didn't have faith. So we see that in the scriptures, and it's true. But also on the other side, on the other hand, it, which is also true, that at the same time, it, it sort of balances that, because sometimes you can, it could all be about faith, not grace. 
that God is a God of grace. At the same time, it is true that, as we see in Zechariah, even sometimes when we lack faith, God still performs the miracle. God still performs the miracle. And I'm so grateful for that. I mean, you can get into places where it feels like nothing's going to happen for you because you don't have enough faith. But what we see here is, even when we are not faithful, even if we don't have faith, God does the miracle, and I'm so grateful for that because most of the time, that's me. For some stuff, I lack faith. I don't believe it's going to happen. And God sees through all my doubts and concerns and does the miracle anyway. Amen, somebody. He does the miracle anyway. The text says, you did not believe my words, which will still come true, which will still happen. God does, God does come because, he doesn't come because we are good. He comes because he is good. God does, he doesn't come because we are faithful. He comes because he is faithful. If we, even if we don't wait faithfully, God is faithful to come. I, 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 there's a sense that that's just a word for someone. That even if we are not faithful in your waiting, God is faithful in his coming. And the story continues. It says, the time came for Elizabeth to give birth. And they had a son. They named him John. And, and immediately Zechariah could speak again. Zechariah was loosed and he could speak again. And the first thing he does is to bless God. That's what we see. The first thing he does, he starts to sing the song of praise. This is how we get to the song of Zechariah. Singing is still a good response to God's grace. For, especially for some of us who lack faith. For some of us who, who there's a sense that, you know, we, you know, are waiting, we're not faithful. When God comes through, our only response is singing. We all have a song to sing. We all do. I think I mentioned that even last week, that we do, we, we, we have a song to sing. And, and, and sometimes we, we get convinced, you know, with fear or whatever, that, that the only time we, get, we can sing our song is when everything is perfect. But no, that, that, that's not actually the... The goal of singing, it's not the goal of, it's not that you, you can only sing in the right mood, in the right, when things are happening right. You sing because there's, a, there's something happening in your life. You can sing even about your vulnerabilities. You are a medium of a great song because wherever you are, God is doing something. Even, I mean, the song, you know, we, we, all, song, we, see, we all sing the song, uh, Miracle Worker. Even if we don't see it, he's still working. And therefore, we can sing. God wants us to just start singing. And this is what we see with Zechariah. He starts singing. Now, I'm not going to go in depth with the song. In fact, I, it feels like I've just done the, the context of the song. But the song itself... You know, it, 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 it's the song that gives a grand overview of God's promises of salvation and deliverance to his people. Zechariah is singing that God has finally come through. He says, praise be to God, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. What he does here is Zechariah take us through the Old Testament, the promises of God, to say the promises of God has finally come in their fulfillment in this person who will be born. That, that, that's what Advent is about, to say God does, he, he does what he promises to do. All his promises find their yes and amen in the person of Jesus. The coming of Jesus, they tell us that the old scriptures, the Old Testament is true. What he promised to Adam, to Eve, what he promised to Abraham, what he promised to the Israelites, what he promised to the prophets, it culminates right here in front of us. And, and here's the thing about Advent. Remember, Advent is about 
the, the, the first coming of Jesus, what we're seeing here, 2,000 years ago, but also anticipating his second coming. And what Advent does, it says, as he came in this first coming, we can be sure that he will come in his second coming. And the Advent brings these two comings, as it were, together. You know, uh, uh, the, the Jews believed in two ages. They believe in this age right now and the age to come. And they felt like, you know, this age is filled with darkness, it's filled with sorrow, it fills with brokenness, all of these things. But there will be an age to come filled with healing, filled with shalom, filled with all of these things in the age to come. But what Advent teaches us and what the gospel teaches us and what the coming of Jesus teaches us is that the age to come has broken in in the age right now. The age to come filled with shalom and prosperity and, 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 and the goodness of God has broken in right now in the work and the person of Jesus. And therefore we get the glimpses we get the showers, as it were, not the full rain. The kingdom has not fully come. We get the showers, as it were, of the full shalom that is to come. And therefore, we stand in this tension of our waiting. We are waiting. Come, Lord Jesus. Bring your justice. Bring everything that we long for. But we get a foretaste. We get a foretaste. And all Jesus is asking us, be faithful in your waiting. Will you be righteous and blameless in your waiting? As I have come, I will surely come. Friends, as I mentioned at the beginning, the, 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 the goal is not for Advent to be abstract. So I do want to speak to us in our living rooms. What does your ordinary life look like right now? Bills piling up family getting together for, for, for Christmas and all of these things with no finances, kids getting sick, you getting sick, you've lost work, relationships are broken, marriage has never been this difficult. What does it mean for Jesus to come into your living room right now. What does it mean that Jesus has come? It means that there's hope again in your waiting. That's what Advent was to bring us. By the work of the Spirit, God's promises come to pass. And by the work of the Spirit, you can wait. You don't have to be disobedient. You don't have to be rebellious. You don't have to lose your faith. You don't have to do all of these things. But you can be righteous and blameless like Mary and Elizabeth in your waiting. Because God's promises, they are true. And in all our waiting, here's what waiting points us to. In all our waiting, you could be waiting for work. You could be waiting for, uh, you've been single, you're waiting for someone. You could be waiting. All this longing we have, they point us into the deeper longing that we have. The longing for the shalom to come brought by Jesus. All of these longings that we have. They point us to the, the real longing. We are longing for Jesus. And all these longings, they point us to him. In all your waiting, don't lose the bigger waiting. We are waiting for the coming king. And if you can be obedient in the smallest things, he will come in your smallest things. But it'll all, you will fully come to renew all things to himself. In all your waiting, keep your gaze on Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is true. Your word is alive. And I pray that it will 
speak to us, that he has spoken to us even today, because we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.